Good morning. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome online viewers and thank you for viewing this. My name is Karabon Hilly. I'm working in the uh, Social Science, School of Social Sciences and, and Department of Population Studies and Demography. Today we'll be presenting on the Population Studies and, uh, and Demography. And firstly, I'd like to I'll lay down the background on Population Studies and my colleagues will take over looking into the uh, planning use projections and later on in look into the interaction between population development and environment. And lastly, we have a colleague who will also talk about the experiences of working, of having uh, gained um, uh, qualified from uh, the population studies department. I look into this, I just want to start by looking at what is population studies and demography. Often when we talk about this, people think that we are more interested in just the size of the population, which is not the case. We are also interested in the composition of that population. We are more interested also in the interaction between population and development and population and environment, and how these two factors also affect the population uh, size, uh, composition and structure. Looking into this, you can see that population differs from one place to the other. Some populations have got more people, others tend to have more younger people, others more women relative, relative to, to women. So population differs, depend on where you are and what you are looking at. Also, if you look at the age structure, some populations are quite younger, okay? Majority of the people, a significantly higher number of people in that population are younger people. If you go to other countries, for example, in the developed countries, we do have a relatively higher number of elderly people. So the age structure of the population tend to differ depending on different aspects uh, uh, and what's happening in that particular societies. And for us to understand this, is, this changes in a population, we, demographers focus on the three important demographic processes and that is the birth, uh, death, and migration. For example, the birth rate will impact on, on the population size, will increase the population size, but not only uh, the population size, it will affect as well the younger age structure because as more births are born into the society, we tend to have more people uh, increasing at the younger age group. If you look at death rate, for example, it's likely to impact on the elderly, among the elderly, because as you grow older, you're more likely to die. The probability of dying is higher compared to other people in other age group. Migration as well impact on the size, but it also impact on the, the population composition and structure. It can increase the size, it can reduce it depending on whether people are going out or going in. And this uh, uh, predominantly affect the middle age uh, ages of the population. So this is uh, demographers actually focus on the, these three important things to so try to understand how population is likely to change in future and what are the issues affecting the population, how, uh, what are the factors affecting the structure and the size of the current population and also the future population. So this is very important, that's why demographers spend some time looking at theories on uh, uh, migration, theories of uh, fertility or birth rate, and theories of mortality, because understanding these issues help us to understand how population is likely to change in future. If, for example, you look into uh, this, uh, uh, the graph here shows that population is not stable, has been increasing, the world population has been increasing, and is expected to increase in future. But how it's going to increase is not certain. You have to have to understand exactly how for example, fertility or birth rate is likely to change in future. We have to understand how mortality is likely to change in future. And this is based on the current assumption that we have about mortality and fertility. You need to understand those factors that are driving mortality, factors that are driving fertility, and how this is likely to affect the future population size and structure. So this is very important to understand this in order to be able to know what's likely to happen in future. Demographers also, they learn from the past. Look into this, that um, 
we can see from that, well, the population has not been growing, uh, growing at the same uh, rate. Uh, it took uh, um, quite a number of years for population to reach 1 billion in 1800, but it took 130 years for that population to double. And if you can look into the, um, the doubling between the, the, okay, the second and the fourth billion, it took only 45 years, that is 30 years and uh, 15 years, 45 years for population to double. And we're expecting that the population will reach 8 billion very soon, and I think the time to that uh, doubling period will be uh, smaller compared to the previous time. We learn from this is what happened in the past. Why was the population so sluggish in the past? What are the main factors driving this, uh, uh, this population, slow population growth? What happened in the, currently that the population is growing that uh, faster now, that the doubling time becoming shorter and shorter? These are the issues that demographers are interested in and try to learn from the past and see how we can use the experiences from the past to try to understand the current issues and what is likely to happen in future. So the growth rate differs between us. We also, in order to understand these changes, we have to measure these changes happening there. And this is just one example to see what is happening in these uh, countries, what is happening in this particular population. For example, the total fertility rate, which refers to the average number of children that the woman will have in her lifetime. Okay. So you can see that this differs between the different uh, areas. If you look at the more developed countries, for example, okay, um, the more developed countries, uh, the richer countries, that the average number of children that the woman will have is less than two, that is below the replacement level. However, if you look into poorer countries, Again, um, the, the, the picture is quite different. We tend to have a very high level of fertility. And there are different issues um, uh, that are at play in this case. So we need to understand this and try to measure these changes and understand how this changes, how this uh, levels of fertility and mortality will impact on our future population and our planning, because this is very important, critical for planning. Having looked into this, um, we can see that the dependency rate also tend to differ because of the levels of mortality, the levels of fertility, the previous levels of mortality and fertility in that particular area. If you look into the world, for example, on the number of people under the age of 15, that is a zero to 14, contribute 26% of the world population. And the number of the aged people, 16 and above, contribute only 13%. Um, of uh, the elderly. However, if you look into Africa, Africa has got the highest dependency rate. That is, the number of people who are in a dependent age, 0 to 14, almost 41% of the population in Africa is actually under the age of 15. And that has got an implication for planning because it means that the population will have to spend more in maintaining these young children. If you look at uh, Europe, for example, and that graph, Europe only has 16% of uh, the ages 0 to 14. What does it mean? That well, they will spend a lot, uh, relatively less amount of money in maintaining the children because this uh, the dependent group of people. So Africa has got more burden compared to other things. And this is also has got implication for economic development. If you've got more people in the middle age group, the working age group, they contribute to the economy and they pay taxes and they are less, they are not dependent on uh, the other age group. So the economy is likely to grow. So this has got an implication for planning and um, also dependency issue around there. If you look, for example, uh, one of the examples of the more developed countries, the population size, using the population pyramid, it tells a lot about the past experiences of that particular uh, population, population of Canada, for example. It tells us more about um, the way in which mortality, the levels of mortality and levels of fertility. You can see, looking into that uh, population, that um, the life expectancy is quite high because people are surviving to a higher age group. Okay. 
and we've got a very less number of people in the, uh, in the younger age group, meaning that the birth rate is actually declining that. And the implication, the developmental implication for this uh, particular population will be totally different because you have to plan more for elderly people, make sure that the services are catered for the elderly people. We also see that the number of women to men differs in the particular population. If you go older, I mean, we tend to have more women than men as a result because women have got a life, uh, longer life expectancy compared to men. And you can see that at the top there, we tend to have a lot of um, more females than males. And this also has got an implication for planning. If you look into some of the developing countries, the pyramids in the developing countries, the reverse is true, where more and more people are in the younger age group. And therefore, like I said, the society or the government has to spend a lot of money maintaining these people. Instead of working, bringing taxes like it is the case, they're actually dependent on the working ages. And you can see there are relatively fewer people in the working age group. And of course, again, we know that employment rate uh, is very low in this uh, 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 particular country. So this is the challenges in this particular uh, uh, population will be different compared to other populations. Okay. Having look into this, what is that? What, what are the implications of all this in the okay, with the changing age structure? Um, and we need to understand in the context of development planning, what services you're going to provide, how do you plan for this particular study? And that planning will depend on who is inside your society. If you've got more younger people, schooling, for example, will be, um, the main issue, providing schooling for this. So the government has to spend a lot of taxes providing schooling and, for example, um, uh, other things that will maintain the children. Um, more middle-aged group housing is the most pressing issue. But if you've got an elderly population, for example, the, uh, like Canada, medical facilities will be the more pressing because as people get older, they're likely to have, they will need more medical facilities because they, as you grow older, you agree with me that you become sick and sick, okay. Social problems also differ depending on the society you're looking at. Migration, for example, we know that migration has been uh, topical issues in the West. Um, issues around poverty and gender issues, depending on the number of, of women and men in particular society and how advanced that uh, particular population is. It also, the population, uh, the policies will tend to differ between these different uh, uh, areas, for example, the population and environmental policies, where there are more pressing issues to uh, maintain young children, the government is more concerned about that and less concerned about the environment. However, in some areas where government has got a lot of money, environmental issues will come to the fore and people will address this. So population, in short, has got a very a serious implication for development, and we need to look into that. We need to understand the factors changing the current population, but also factors looking into the future uh, population, because this is, we will need for planning purposes. We will need to understand how the population is likely to change and what is we likely to have in that uh, particular um, uh, population. And by this, I'd like to say thank you for having listened to me. And thank you very much. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh. Can you take this off your side? No, I'm running over here. <laughs> thank you.
Good morning. I'll continue from where my colleague has stopped. My name is Martin Palamuleni. I'm from Population Studies Program. Now, demography gives you a tool to understand and address some of the challenges that were highlighted earlier. For example, the issue of population aging. And one such tool that we make use of is population projections. And there are several organizations, national, international, that prepare population projections. Some of these organizations are Population Reference Bureau in the US, United States of America, US Bureau of Census, and United Nations, particularly the Population Division. And the United Nations prepare projections every two years. Let me also mention here, population projections are nothing but future estimates of the size and the structure of the population based on certain assumptions regarding fertility, mortality, and migration. So every th uh, two years, the, uh, the United Nations prepare population projections. And when we prepare projections, we normally prepare several scenarios. As far as the UN are concerned, they do have the low, medium, and high scenario. Have many, but choose one. You will basically find that although they have uh, three scenarios, they, they recommend one, the median uh, scenario for planning purposes. And that's now what we call population uh, forecast. And I will restrict here um, some of the figures that are coming from the, the United Nations. The red line basically represent the high scenario, the blue one, the median, uh, uh, medium scenario, and the green one, the low population uh, scenario. What, what these uh, numbers are basically saying, if we assume that we are currently around 7.8 million, it means with a high scenario, the population is going to increase to say 15, billion uh, by uh, 2100. 20, but if we follow the green one, the low scenario, population is going to um, reduce slightly to something like 6.2 billion by the end of projection pe uh, period. But the blue one, which is now the recommended, you will basically find that the population is going to increase from around 7.2 8 billion uh, currently to something like 9.3 billion uh, in 2050 and then reach something like 10.1 billion by the end of our projection uh, period. This is also something worth taking note of. You will find that sometimes we think if, for example, we reduce fertility rate current to the, uh, from the present level to something like uh, 2.1, the replacement level, things will stop growing. But uh, I'll show you later on, things do not happen like that because future mothers or mothers in the next, say, 15 years, they're already born uh, as we speak now. We talk of population mo uh, momentum. In the next slide, what I'm basically trying to share with you is basically that population distribution, population growth varies by continent, um, world regions. And you basically find as far as Africa is, is concerned, sorry, as far as Africa is concerned, it has the largest percentage share uh, in terms of uh, uh, population increase. Population is expected for Africa to, in the percentage share for Africa is expected to increase from something like 15.9 in 2015 to 19.4 by the end of the period. Whereas when you look at Asia, it's more or less going to remain constant. Um, it will change very little from around 
59% to 58%. Europe is basically going to decline from 10% to 9%. Um, Caribbean is more or less going to remain the same from 8.6 to 8.5. Um, North America is going to again remain the same, uh, 4.9% to something like uh, 4.8. And Oceania is going to increase just slightly to, point, uh, to 5 point, from point, uh, point 0 to point, uh, 0.6. Uh, by the end of the projection uh, period. It's the same thing that I'm presenting here, but in terms of growth rates, but just to highlight that when you look at the global population growth rate, it uh, peaked in the 60s, and after that, it has basically been coming uh, down. Look at what is happening with Africa. That's basically the blue line. Africa now has uh, the largest population uh, growth rate, uh, this blue one. If you look at almost all the other areas, population growth rate is coming down. If I may link to what we have been saying uh, all along, it's basically saying if nothing is not done, Africa will experience more challenges in future, population problems uh, in future. And we have to consider some of, uh, some of these issues as far as socioeconomic planning is concerned. And to make things also worse, you basically find that 90, nearly 98% of the next billion will be in developing nations. And quite a good chunk of that will basically be in Africa. Um, so that there is actually more work for us uh, to do. And this is the other challenge that uh, we have also been um, alluding to uh, since we started our presentation. It's this nexus. You basically find that population affects development and development affects population. It's a two-way relationship. Development is going to affect the environment, and the environment is also going to affect um, uh, development. And the environment also affects population, and population affects um, the environment. And understanding this, some of these issues is very critical in so, in, uh, in so far as socioeconomic development uh, is concerned. It's the same thing presented rather differently. We, ha we have, for example, um, the f we have, for example, the first um, box, if I may call it that way, demographic uh, issues, parameters in terms of size, age sex structure, distribution. These are going to affect the socioeconomic processes. Uh, like, for example, if you have more people uh, in the household, you are going to have less money uh, to save, to invest. And there's a common phrase, from hands to mouth. The little money you make, uh, it just goes to buying food, um, consumption goods, um, as, as it were. Now, you basically find these socioeconomic processes will now have an impact on, the, um, on this uh, box, the socioeconomic uh, income, the socioeconomic outcome in terms of income, employment, education, health, etc. If you don't save, you basically find that uh, your economy is not to grow. No jobs created, uh, leading uh, maybe to higher uh, employment, um, unemployment in the population. And as a result of that, demographic processes, fertility, mortality, migration, they are also affected. And it's like we are now in a vicious circle 
And the challenge becomes, where do we break this uh, cycle, cycle if we are to um, improve our standard of living? Now, uh, my colleague earlier on also alluded to this particular thing about theories. Uh, you basically find, as we develop, both fertility and mortality decline. In most cases, mortality will decline earlier than fertility. Why is that the case? Almost all of us in this room, we are afraid of death. But we may have different views as far as having children is concerned. And the people before us, they have come up with this famous theory, the theory of demographic transition that talks about how fertility, mortality uh, changes as the societies move from traditional to modern as we develop, basically. And I'm sure most of us who have come across this beautiful uh, table that talks about, graph that talks about stage one, where we have high fertility, high mortality, and stage four, where we have um, uh, low fertility and low mortality. This is the developed stage. And I'm sure all of us would like to reach that particular uh, stage. But the thing I also wanted to underline, as we move from, from stage one to stage four, the age structure changes. And see what has happened to that population pyramid. It's changing over time. Uh, at low levels of development, it's triangular shaped. But as the year goes by, as we develop, you basically find it's becoming bell shaped. I sometimes uh, say this, we move from one set of problems to another set of challenges. Each stage has got its own unique characteristics and unique uh, uh, problems. But one good thing also, with the changes in the age structure, as the time goes on, you reach a stage where you have more people in the working age groups. You have more people in, uh, aged between 15 to 64 than age uh, below 15 or above 65. And when we reach that stage, uh, we in demography, we believe you can reap from what we call demographic dividend. But it doesn't come cheap. You must uh, put in place, you must have good policies in terms of education, uh, health, housing, and so on and so forth. Asian countries, they passed through, they benefited from demographic uh, dividend. I am yet to see an African country benefiting. But it offers that opportunity, that window of opportunity uh, for us uh, to benefit from. However, uh, the issues that we have actually been uh, talking about is rapid population growth is expected to negatively affect health, health services. Uh, as population grows, you need more health facilities, more doctors, more, more nurses, more drugs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As population growth, uh, you basically find you need more teachers, more classrooms. Uh, if nothing is done, there will be congestion in the classroom. On average, maybe one teacher is supposed to have something like 33 learners, one educator to 33. You are able to follow. But uh, uh, if you are experiencing rapid population growth, as the case is in Africa, you will find that challenges do happen. You can then have a situation, one educator is having 100 learners. Uh, problems will come in, um, et cetera, et cetera. Urbanization, congestions on the roads, 
challenges in terms of housing. That's why in most urban areas, there's actually a growth of um, shanty towns, informal settlements. They are all over. There are so many challenges. Environment, it's affected. People have to cut down trees to build houses, to build roads. Air pollution will come in. If those trees are not replaced, soil erosion uh, will also occur, and so on and so forth. And you remember that issue I was basically saying, it's like we're, we're in a cycle. If now the soil is eroded, you plant uh, crops, maize, you have challenges by the end of the day. The output will actually come down. There are people who have even said that you find because of uh, the changes in the environment, the maize today or the meat we have today, it does not taste the same uh, say 50 years ago, things uh, have indeed changed. Uh, so that in the next um, uh, slide, I'm basically trying to uh, illustrate some of those issues I mentioned in terms of uh, healthcare. There are only two beds, somebody sleeping on the floor, challenges will come in. The issue of soil de uh, degradation is almost all over uh, the globe but it's, it will be worse or if it's not already worse uh, where we have rapid population growth like uh, in Africa. Uh, look at the issue of housing, informal settlements, and there are already backlogs, urbanization con uh, congestions on the roads, and it's very difficult under those circumstances to drive. Uh, but if nothing is not done, uh, will reach uh, that particular stage. Thank you very much. Good day, viewers. My name is Kahiso Tlenpake, a former student of the Northwest University uh, under the program Population Studies. Uh, the first thing that we all need to know is that the Northwest University is the only university which offers an undergraduate degree in Population Studies. We also offer a postgraduate diploma in Population Studies. We also have an honors degree in Population Studies, a master's degree in Population Studies, and a doctoral degree in Population Studies. As a former student of the Northwest University under the Population Studies program, I was equipped with knowledge in terms of Population Studies, where I had the ability to understand what is migration, what is fertility, and what is mortality. 
When we speak about migration, we are speaking about the movement of people from different cities and different countries into other cities and other countries. When we speak about fertility, we are referring to births, cases such as births. How many babies are being born in a day? How many babies are being born in a month? And how many babies are being born in a year? It also equipped me with mortality, where I had the ability to understand why is it that people are dying? Why do we need to know that people are dying? And as a former student, I had the ability to work in a provincial department which was known as the Planning Commission, where we had uh, the ability to develop a, a developmental plan which was for the province. The purpose of the developmental plan was mainly to focus and to follow uh, the South African National Development Plan, which is aimed in 2030. From there, I moved on from that department and went to a secondary school where I had the ability to teach geography. Now, in geography, I focused mainly on development and on population issues. From there, I moved from uh, the secondary school and was employed by the university as a lecturer. I am currently teaching both undergraduate and postgraduate students. I am also supervising both undergraduate and postgraduate researchers. Now, the purpose of understanding and studying an undergraduate degree in population studies it, it's that it also equips you with research skills. I am currently uh, equipped with conducting both qualitative and quantitative research. I have the ability to analyze data in terms of spoken words, and I also have the ability to analyze data in terms of numbers. The program also equipped me with a program which is known as the SPSS, the Statistical Package for Social Sciences, which allows one to analyze numbers, very, very large numbers, and make uh, an understanding out of those numbers. So within the population department, we also have a lot of experienced individuals, whereby we have professors and doctors who are there to assist students. Uh, the program of population studies can allow a student to work in non-governmental organizations, such as the United Nations. It can allow a student to work in provincial departments, such as the Department of Health, the Department of Social Development, and also in municipalities. Now, the program is very vast as it also offers modules such as uh, Economics 101, Academic Literacy 101, Sociology and Development Studies. The program furthermore is also a multidisciplinary program which has the ability to link with other different departments such as Health Studies. When one has a degree in Population Studies, they can also understand what is currently happening within the Health Studies. Thank you very much.